Now we know the self-correcting mechanism will always take our GDP back to its potential level. But we do have some economists arguing for active policy intervention in order to close these output gaps. Why is that? Why do economists want to intervene in the economy when they know that the output gaps will be eventually taken care of? The main concern for these economists is the high cost of self-correction. This could be in terms of very high unemployment till we are back to our potential, or it could be in terms of very high price level because remember, whenever we have an inflationary output gap, in the long run, it drives the price level up. And whenever we have recessionary gaps, it can be many years before we go back to our potential. Now, how long will it take for your output gap to be eventually eliminated through self-correction? It depends on your flexibility of wages. Economies which have very rigid wages, very sticky wages, um, the adjustment mechanism can take many years, even decades. And economies which have relatively flexible wages, the adjustment mechanism could be relatively shorter time period. However, it will take some time and does not occur overnight. And therefore, we see this recommendation for active stabilization policies being used in order to bring our economy back to its potential in order to avoid these high costs of inflation or high costs of unemployment. So we can again assume some factor changing or a shock to our macroeconomy. And now instead of waiting for self-correcting mechanism to transpire, we will intervene with active stabilization policies. Again, let's assume there is a negative demand shock. We know a negative demand shock pushes your price level down, GDP down, unemployment is now higher. So that's your short run effect. And now we don't want to wait for wages to adjust and short run aggregate supply curve to eventually change and close this output gap because we know that could be a very long time before that happens. And during that time period, we'll have to bear the high cost of unemployment. And therefore, we move towards the alternative of stabilization policy. Stabilization policy, remember, can be of two types. It can be fiscal or it can be monetary. Both of these policies will affect our aggregate demand curve. Now, you have to decide what type of stabilization policy do we need in the face of a negative demand shock. Negative demand shock, note, is reducing your price level and reducing your GDP. In order to restore my output back to potential or my price level back to P1, I can use expansionary stabilization policy. It can be expansionary fiscal or it can be expansionary monetary policy. Either of these can be used to stimulate aggregate demand. If I'm using fiscal policy, so let's call it option A, it could be through increases in my government purchases, increases in trans or decreases in taxes. So let's write our AD just as a quick reminder. Government purchases are directly affecting your aggregate demand curve and transfers and, and taxes are going to stimulate your consumption spending because of changes in your disposable income. Expansionary fiscal policy will affect your aggregate demand curve and shift it to the right. As the AD shifts to the right, you can see that we have gone back to our original equilibrium point E1 and both price level and GDP have been restored. So we have achieved price stability, we have achieved our output goal with the same expansionary fiscal policy. We could have used um, expansionary monetary policy instead, and that's our option B. In this case, the central bank will reduce the interest rate. Now, lower interest rates are only done through increases in money supply. With higher money supply, people don't need to borrow as much. Interest rate is driven down. At lower interest rate, consumption and investment are stimulated. Aggregate demand increases and shifts to the right. And as you can see, we are back to higher output level and higher price level, just like we did with our expansionary fiscal policy. So both policies are choices. We can use either one in order to close recessionary output gaps, which are caused because of demand shocks. Demand shocks are relatively easier to deal with. The same policy maker will achieve both our goals of price and output stability. On the other hand, if you're facing a supply shock, our problem becomes a dilemma. Now we will not be able to use the same type of policy in order to achieve both our targets of price stability and output stability. So let's assume we have a negative supply shock and the negative supply shock could be in terms of wages suddenly going up or if some major commodity is now more expensive than before. So input prices have short up and that causes your short run AS to decrease. Note that as short run AS is 
decreasing, it is pushing the price up and output lower. So this is our stagflation happening over here. Recession accompanied by higher price level. If my target is to close the output gap, so I want to maintain my output at its potential level. So this is my main target. Then I should be now stimulating the economy through expansionary stabilization policies. So it could be expansionary fiscal or expansionary monetary, just like we did last time. Either of these will stimulate our aggregate demand and shift it to the right. And as AD increases, we are at our equilibrium E3. This is because of active policy intervention. And in doing so, we have achieved our output goal, but at the cost of even higher price level. And this is where we have our dilemma. We can achieve our output goal in the face of a supply shock, but at the cost of letting go of our price stability goal. So we have to bear the cost of even higher inflation in order to maintain our output targets. Let's do the opposite now. We have the same negative supply shock causing stagflation in the economy. Price level is higher than our desired price level and output is lower than our potential. So we are facing a recessionary gap. In order to maintain my price stability goal, let's assume that's our hierarchical goal of for the policymakers. I would want to now dampen aggregate demand. So uh, why am I dampening AD? Because I want to bring the price level down back to its desired level P1. I can dampen AD through contractionary fiscal policy or contractionary monetary policy. Contractionary fiscal would be reduction in government purchases, increase in taxes, or reduction in transfers. Contractionary monetary policy would be increase in our interest rates by reducing money supply. When money supply is reduced in the economy, people need to borrow more funds. As they borrow more, interest rates are driven up. Now with higher interest rates, overall consumption and investment will be reduced and they will both put downward pressure on our AD. So with lower aggregate demand, either through fiscal policy or through monetary policy, we can put downward pressure on our price level. On the diagram, AD shifts to the left and it puts downward pressure on our price level and we have achieved our target E1. So our goal of price stability has been achieved. But at what cost? At my new equilibrium E3, while I'm achieving my P1 goal, my output has further re reduced to Y3. So we are faced with an even bigger recessionary gap because of trying to maintain our price stability goal. And that's the dilemma that we keep referring to in the face of supply shocks. In the face of supply shocks, policymakers cannot achieve output stability while maintaining their price stability targets. So they have to choose between the two. Should they be countering inflation or should they be countering high unemployment? Now that brings us to the end of our chapter. This chapter analyzed our business cycle fluctuations. So what can be some economic factors that can cause business cycle expansions and recessions. We also saw in this chapter how output always converges towards potential level through the self-correcting mechanism of the model. And lastly, we saw the role of macroeconomic policy in trying to stabilize the economy. So it's a very comprehensive model and explains many different aspects of the business cycle. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you guys next time.